We can start our paper with a platitude that we all live in a networked, uh, networked world, the fur and model for individual and collective life. It's therefore not surprising that it's quite common to talk about a way of thinking called network thinking. What's more, so-called network science is now a theoretical discipline on its own right with a broad application in sociology, political science, computer and information science, epidemiology, and so on. Some scholars argue that networks are a category of study that transcends traditional academic boundaries and that has the potential to unite different disciplines through a shared understanding of the complexity of our world. Current way of uh, network thinking uh, naturally influences our research, the topics we deal with and the perspective with which we view them. And of course, our history is no exception in this respect. Our historical thinking has also been affected by this network turn. Contemporary art history and visual studies are therefore interested in network as a methodological tools, as a metaphors for understanding forms of relations, as a descriptors of social forms, but also as a concept whose various forms and applications are sought and traced in the past. One illustrative example could be uh, Geoffrey Hamburger's research on diagrams in medieval thought and art, because diagrams are fundamental relational, in character and network visualization would not be possible without graph theory, which also include diagrams. Another example is Hamburger's inquiry in, into medieval illuminated manuscripts through the prism of hypertext. All these new perspectives based on the principles of modern technologies and the functioning of the contemporary world allow us to enrich our existing methods and approaches in our history. As a result, we can ask new types of questions and reach new ways of solving them. In this chapter, Tangled Metaphors, Network Thinking and Network Analysis in the History of Art, Matthew Lincoln writes that, I quote, it's quite possible to write productively about art historical networks without even touching on data, computing or mathematics. The intention of today's conference, which has put networks in its title, is to work with this concept as a tool to analyze the intricate social relations between actors. At the same time, here, the central actor is meant to be the personality of the artist or the artist in plural. However, long before the network boom, or we can call it network turn, our history had already been using concept to capture the relationships uh, between entities be they artists, artworks, art schools, styles, and forms. From this point of view, networks may thus appear to be only the logical successor to earlier concepts that art history had hitherto used to describe relations. Since the 1990s, the concept of networks has gradually appeared to be only logical successor to early concepts. And since 1990s, the concept of networks has gradually become a term that has largely superseded and replaced earlier concepts of relations in our history. And it was due to its growing popularity and ubiquity. And it has done so without the guarantee that it would always offer the possibility of capturing these relations more consistently in relation to the reality under analysis. Therefore, the aim of our paper is not only to describe the genesis of network thinking and network rhetoric in the history of art, but also to point out the limits and a certain degree of manipulativeness of networks. Because we believe that the positive aspects that the concept of the network entails are rather obvious to the conference participants. My colleague Tomasz Kolich uh, will show you a concrete example of this later, but before that, I would like to return to the situation of our historical methodology that allowed uh, network thinking and the concept of the network to subsequently be applied in the our history with uh, considerable, I would say, self-evidence. With a certain degree of simplification, it can be seen that the said that the concept of influence can be considered the precursor to which networks have successfully built up in art history. We are aware, however, that two concepts, uh, 
networks and influence differ in a number of important aspects and grow out of the different perspectives, but their continuity and entanglement with each other in our history is obvious, as I will briefly show. It's the mapping of influence from artist to artist, especially the stylistic one or the formalist one, that may be one of the keys to the subsequent successful and widespread application of network concepts in art history. As early as 1905, well-known art historian Heinrich Welflin linked the two concepts of elite influence and networks when he referred to networks of artistic influence in reference to Albrecht Dürer. Albeit in order to argue that Dürer transcended such influences. Similarly, one of the most famous diagrams in our history, Alfred Barr's iconic diagram of stylistic evolution, is nothing more than a simple visualization of a network of influences. But uh, it was this, this satisfaction with uh, the vague but frequently used category of influence in our history that later led some art historian to criticize influenceology in our history. As a consequence, attempts were made either to replace influence with, with a completely different concept or to construct influence as a rationally verifiable category that would give our historical studies uh, a strictly rational and logical basis. A relatively unique attempt to, in the later case, uh, was Geran Hermener's book, book uh, published in 1975, which sought to examine, examine influence on the basis of strict, strict logic and semantics. The result was equations, scales, charts, and diagrams that were intended to capture different types and scale of influence. A similar past uh, was taken uh, by another two art historians, Julius Hroschitsky and Vladimir Odinets, who in 1981 designed a system to measure the diverse path of influence that connect different art objects. Although their method was elaborate and I would say detailed, uh, the result was visualization, visualizations whose explanatory value was, I would say, marginal. In all these cases that I showed, uh, however, there were attempts to capture the artistic links by measurable and therefore quantitative methods. The only problem was that applying them to the vague concept of influence often presented uh, and I would say unsuperable challenge or rather an obstacle. The very concept of influence was however too closely tied to the traditional model of our history, which was character characterized by the notion of a flowing and continually evolving history, succession of styles, historical narration, by the notion of the causality of relations and the power of tradition. The critical view of our history on its own problems, however, began from the 1970s at the latest to gradually but surely question these categories and to seek a substitute for them. Social and spatial turn in the history of art caused, the focus, caused that the focus shifted from the isolated artist, the genius and its psychology, to the artist as a part of a wider social context shaped by an intricate web of social relations. From hierarchically defined our ge geography, I mean center periphery relations, it shifted to a horizontally conceived art history. These radical changes uh, in perspective on the basic categories of our history have also changed the views of the relations, links, ties, entanglements and interconnectedness of subjects in our history. Along with uh, these paradigm shifts, entirely new possibilities for working with a large volume of data have emerged as a result of computation, digital transformation, and the widespread availability of uh, digital tools. This has uh, definitely opened the door to new ways of applying network thinking, namely, in network analysis and its visualization in digital environments. 
How network thinking manifests itself through the network analysis visualization is nevertheless a chapter that I leave to a colleague, uh, Tomáš Kolich. Thank you. Very well. As Teresa mentioned, um, you could use the word network as a synonym basically for relationships or context. And I think that holds true for the general theme of this conference, which has in its title the, the friends, the collaborators. And that's a valid use. Um, on the other hand, uh, you have the kind of research that processes huge amounts of data that you cannot do without uh, computational power and produces a lot of visualizations through software like Gephi, for example. And then there is a great area in the middle, kind of gray zone. Uh, you have publications that have the term network or networkism in their title, and you will find in their introductions uh, the names like Bruno Latour and his actor network theory. Sometimes you will find there uh, Piotrowski and Horizontal Art History. But then the book continues with enlisting in great detail a lot of contacts and relationships between different artists, and it doesn't necessarily is not concerned really with the network analysis, or at least is not trying to explain the inner workings of the supposed network structure it is studying. And I will show um, one of these examples, um, which uses also a network diagram. Uh, what I find interesting about network diagrams is that a lot of times it is, once they are created, it is almost automatically assumed that there is some information flowing between the nodes and that the links or the edges that connect them are really the paths of influence. I would argue the most prominent image, um, network image, or also the application of uh, the network concept. Um, was the um, exhibition <coughs> Inventing Abstraction held in 2012 in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Have you seen this image? Maybe even the exhibition? Uh, if, if not, great. Uh, more room for me. And, uh, you know, uh, this was the first thing that the visitor would see as he enters the exhibition. And it was uh, featured on the website in an interactive forum. You could you could click on the particular node, so you would see the connection of the particular person. It was featured in uh, in uh, oh, you know, in media, uh, in articles with titles like uh, "MoMA creates Facebook for abstractionists," and we could understand it as just another kind of embellishment, like uh, maps or chronological axes that we put at the start of exhibitions, but it seems more connected to the approach of the curators. Uh, they were talking about it quite a lot. And as we can see on the website, um, it stated, abstraction was not the inspiration of a solitary genius, but the product of a network thinking. Now, this same sentence is repeated by the director, uh, Lowry, in the catalog. And I must admit, as someone who works in um, gallery, although orders of magnitude of, of the MoMA, I understand the need or tendency of some directors to hype things up, uh, but I'm not sure if MoMA uh, needs that. And uh, the, the text continues. Of ideas moving through a nexus of artists and intellectuals working in different mediums and in far-flung places. Its pioneers were more, clo more closely linked than is generally understood. This diagram maps the relationships among the artists represented in inventing abstraction, all of whom played a significant role in the development of a new modern language for the art. Vectors connect individuals whose acquaintance with one another during these years could be documented. Names in red are those with the most connections within this group. And then there is, there is a small legend in the corner which says that the artists who have more than 24 connections are, are red. That means they are the hub. Now, um, you will not find much more information about that network. Um, it's definitely not in the, in the publication, in the catalog. You know? <clears throat> and the argumentation, in our, my opinion, is quite shallow because uh, I think the Lee Dickerman, the curator, mentions a couple of books from sociology and stating that the 
invention comes within the groups. And they were trying, and she states that they were trying to answer the question, how come that uh, abstract art emerged at different places at the same time? And they see the, uh, the answer, the solution in the interconnected communication. Um, to quote Lee Dickerman, um, uh, this diagram was created with a tip of the head to the famous uh, Alfred H. Barr diagram from his 1936 uh, exhibition, Cubism Abstract Art. And you see the intentional similarity in the, in the colors and in the, in the font. Um, uh, but they are designed to do the opposite. Uh, also, the bar has a whole chapter devoted to him, to that particular diagram in, in the catalog. Um, so uh, what the bar does in this simplified, uh, uh, simplified chart is that he uses basically only, only the names of the styles, of the isms. There are only seven names of particular artists, while the, the network uh, uses only the, the uh, individuals. You know, um, he uh, bar, um, proceeds chronologically from top to bottom. There's no chronology seen in the network. Um, you know, and the vectors of the influence, the arrows uh, in the bar's uh, diagram go only in one direction. So it excludes mutual uh, in, um, no, influence, uh, even, even uh, in the case of, uh, of uh, styles of ism that, that were contemporary. While uh, in, the, in the chart, you cannot see where the influence goes. So it suggests that it's the exchange of whatever flows there is mutual. But I would argue that the, the diagram is not really telling mu uh, that much, uh, at least new. Um, so there is a couple of problems. First, um, in this kind of diagram, you would assume that it's created uh, in the way that's called force directed. It means that the um, uh, means that the nodes go apart and the lakes bring them together. But uh, it also seems that it could, it could be organized based on the geography. You will find the Russians in the east, Germans in the middle, uh, with the France, Americans are in the west, etc. So we, but we don't know. We don't know. Then, you know, uh, the hubs. Uh, for example, uh, Dickerman uh, mentions uh, key connectors um, and the number of their links, like Apollinaire, 28, Marinette, 26, Tara, 24. But she omits, uh, for example, Sonia Delonaterek, which has uh, 27. She's never mentioned. And she, she includes uh, Steiglitz, which, but he has only 19. He doesn't have the necessary number. But the, the biggest problem is that we don't know what's floating or flowing through this, this diagram. Like, is it? Is it an intense discussion of art ideas, or are they sending postcards? Uh, if Kanitsky is the key connector, as uh, Dickerman states, uh, is he uh, you know, a place of transfer and diffusion, or is, uh, are these just one-sided monologues? Uh, it's never mentioned anywhere. Um, if you dig deep, you will find that the, it was um, created, actually, by a Professor Ingram from a New York Business School. And this is a screenshot from a video on the website. So it originally it was created as a sophisticated quite, uh, visualization, but then it was rendered uh, by the graphic designers of the exhibition to be closer to the bar chart. Now, I will come to conclusion here, uh, stating this uh, nice quote from Václav Richter uh, when he uh, talks about the influence. Art history often imagines the spread of influences from a certain developmental source as a mechanical process, similar to acoustic waves or to ripples on the surface of water after a disturbance. This means that a wave further away from the focal point must be preceded by a wave closer to the focal point. However, historical events are much more complex. And you have seen the, the attempts for Hermann and Sado to make it more precise. And it could seem that now, with the advance of networks, we actually really can measure the influence. But in the end, it's important to, to remind ourselves that it's another model. Uh, we used to think it about, uh, about the influence as the waves, and now we think about it as the dots and lines between them. Uh, you, could, you could use different kinds of visualization. You could uh, visualize the communication of abstractionists as a pie chart, for example. You would lose some aspects of information, you would gain others. 
The difference is no one would claim that the pie chart thinking was invention, led to invention of abstract art, or that the pie chart is this underlying structure of our universe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Teresa and Tomáš, for your uh, paper. Are there any questions? If not, maybe let me start. Uh, were there maybe any attempts to try to trace any connections between the artists that are not uh, based on textual sources uh, and uh, try to make a, a diagrammatic representation of that? Or do you think it's actually an option? You mean specifically... Uh in the exhibition or generally generally um as, as far as i know the, the data they pour usually into the system are text-based mm -hmm. uh, and and the articles that are uh, uh, from the people who actually do network modeling and the things they are warning about is that this leads naturally to to um omittance or um, of um of of the other times of connection that they don't mean taking part basically Thank you very much. There are some methods or approaches that try to capture relations uh, between actors uh, without uh, any testimony of written sources. For example, George Kobler and his shaping of time with the scam of replicas, etc. So it's, I think, specific for anthropology, culture anthropology, which work with this, this example. But uh, in the network analysis, we have to work with data. So written data archives uh, and et cetera. 